house better is a one day in your court thousands elsewhere thousands elsewhere oh, nowhere else we'd rather be oh, nowhere else we'd rather be right in your presence I want to tell you a story. I used to believe. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Hopefully, everyone is doing well on this evening. I uh, hope and pray everyone had a marvelous and beautiful day. Um, is that anyone's feeling right now? Better is one day in your course. Lord, I just want to be in your course. Just that one day is better than a thousand elsewhere. That's all that matters to me, God, just being in your course, being in your presence. Uh, hopefully and prayerfully, that is all of our desires. Uh, that is all of our uh, prayers and hopes just to be in the presence of the Lord. Uh, but I'm excited to be with you on this evening. <clears throat> Always excited to be with you. We could come before the Lord together in our gathering. Um, and this evening, we are going right back to Philippians chapter 4. And our key verses for this evening are verses 6 and 7. So Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Y'all, y'all pray for me too, because right, right now, uh, my bride is in Pittsburgh, and my kids are at their grands, and so I'm in the house by myself. And I don't like this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this. <laughs> my wife thought I was gonna have a good time being in the house by myself. I said, uh, I, don't, I don't like this. <laughs> I need them back. Give me a noisy house <laughs> with toys yeah. and stuff thrown all over the place. <laughs> it makes a difference. <laughs> it does, absolutely. <laughs> You're in the house by yourself, you start hearing things like, I ain't never heard that sound before. <laughs> uh, so scripture for this evening, Philippians chapter four. Uh, I'm actually gonna jump down to verse four in chapter four um, and i'm going to go through verse nine but our key texts are going to be verses six and seven so paul says in verse four he says rejoice in the lord always and i will say it again rejoice let your graciousness be known to everyone the lord is near don't worry about anything but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to god and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He says in verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, we should know this verse, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and any, uh, if anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Um, do what you've learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, let us pray. Father, we um, just ask that you be with us right now. Uh, God, we're so thankful for your presence in our lives, Lord. We're so thankful for um, you being with us, Lord. Every time we come together, Lord, we're so thankful that you are right there in the midst of us. Um, God, I pray that this moment that we come together be no different from any other time that we come together and gather, Lord. Um, we, as we gather for your glory and for our good, God, I pray that you will help us to learn and develop and become spiritually matured. Um, by your word, Father God, I pray that we would be better because of your word, Lord, and 
and we would do better, Lord, as we know better, Lord, as we gain better understanding and deeper clarity of your word, Father God. I pray that it would drive us and move us uh, to be better for you, Lord, to do more for you, Father God, to want more of you in our lives. Uh, Father, we're just so thankful that you are enough for us, uh, that we don't have to look to other places or other things, Father God, that we are satisfied in you and we have complete and full satisfaction in you alone, Christ Jesus. Uh, so, Father, I pray that this time will be beautiful. I pray, Lord, that as you rest upon us, Lord, that everything about our actions and our speech and even our attentiveness, Lord, would be pleasing in your sight. God, we honor you and we thank you for every moment we come together, Lord. Uh, we just want to glorify your name through it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this week we discussed uh, one of the great lifelines that God has given us access to. Uh, one of the things that certainly gives us life and allows us to enter into more godliness. Again, all these lifelines God has given us are for the things that pertain to life and godliness so god has given us access to one of these great lifelines that lead us to more godliness this week we talked about the the lifeline of prayer prayer is one of the most important ways to get into the presence of god one of the more important ways that we we remain connected to god is through the lifeline of prayer and god has given us access to this thing he's given us access to the lifeline of prayer that we may get in his presence that we may take on more of his character. Uh, and this entire series uh, is one that's going to help us to understand the things that we must depend on in this life to allow us to stay connected and to uh, grow in the giver of life. So everything we're going to go through is going to help us to understand everything God has given us, but it also help us to grow and remain connected to the giver of life because that's who we want to remain connected to. That's the person we want to stay connected to. See, there are certain things that we do that sometimes disconnects us from God and even the presence of God. And avoiding these lifelines is one of those things. When we avoid the lifelines, we disconnect ourselves from the presence of God. We avoid getting into the very presence of God. Or when we don't recognize these disciplines, these things that God has given us, when we don't recognize them as lifelines, it's a sure way to fall victim to going through the motions of being a Christian, but there's no real sincerity. It enables us to go through the motions of uh, Christianity, but there's no debt. So we want to ensure we are understanding these lifelines and applying these lifelines because we don't want to end up like the, the believer who only who's only a believer through profession and go through the motions of Christianity. Going through the motions from a behavioral perspective, but never from a spiritual or a dependence perspective. So when we reduce ourselves to going through the motions of the Christian life, it may feel like we're moving. But we're actually becoming motionless. It may feel like we're going places. It may feel like we're doing things, but we've actually become motionless. And one of the last things we should want as a believer is to be a believer who is stagnant. One who looks the part, but never actually does their part. And sure, we, cre we, cre we were created to know the stillness of God, but that's intentional stillness. And intentional stillness is not the same as false motion. So we should be still in the Lord, but we shouldn't be false or, or giving off the sense of false motion as if we believe or think we're going somewhere, yet we're stagnant because we haven't been applying the lifelines that God has given us. So even in our stillness, we still want to ensure we're doing things that matter most when it comes to the presence of God. We want to ensure that we're doing everything that matters most when it comes to the presence of God and when it comes to the things of God, because this is what God desires. God has a desire for his children to use these things in which he's provided us access to, to use these things for our benefit and for his glory. He wants us to do what we must do in order to get into his presence so that we can reveal more of himself or he can reveal more of himself to us and we can take on more of his character. This is what God desires of us as his children. God wants these things for us and from us as his children. See, our Lord is a supernatural God. He's a supernatural God of supernatural people, and he's given us supernatural access to him through the lifeline of prayer. He's given us this amazing access through the lifeline of prayer. So each of us um, are called to be intercessors. We're all called to be intercessors along Jesus, alongside Jesus, who is the chief intercessor. 
Jesus is the chief intercessor and we are just intercessors alongside Jesus as the chief intercessor. And as the vine and the branches, Jesus wants us to produce good fruit. He wants to see us produce good fruit from our lives. And prayer is one of the ways that enables us to produce the fruit that God wants to see come from our lives. But as I mentioned Sunday, it's not about the behavior. It is not about our behavior, but it's about our heart. The behavior will only be as pure as the heart. See, the behavior will only be only changed permanently when there's been a change permanently internally. The external change has to follow the internal change. The ex external change will always follow the internal change. So we have to ensure and prioritize the internal change. That way it will show through our behavior. That way we'll start to do the things that, that go after our hearts. Because our hearts have been postured and turned towards the Lord. So now our behavior will inherently follow these things. So this is a lifeline we need to fully grasp and understand. And this is what Paul is writing about in this text. Paul is writing to get us to understand the lifeline of prayer. He's getting writing to get us to understand the importance of prayer. See, Philippians is Paul's discussion of living the Christian life. He wrote this letter to the believers and Philippi to get them to understand the importance of living the Christian life. And this letter is to the church of Philippi in which Paul highlights such things such as glory and joy. And he also puts great emphasis on um, Christian thinking. He puts great emphasis on the attitude we ought to have as believers that affects our faith, that affects the way we, we move in the life as a Christian. And he's encouraging the church and Philippi to, to steadfastness and to unity. And while he's encouraging the church, he throws in these two verses in this chapter that shows us the amazing benefits we receive when we use this lifeline effectively. So Paul throws in the middle of this, this chapter two very important texts that we have to understand and grab hold of pertaining to the lifestyle and prayer. So that, that was part of Paul's, or this letter rather, was part of Paul's final exhortation to the church which I think he reveals the importance and emphasis of the words he is writing in this text. So in verse six, Paul tells us flat out, he tells the church, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. So he says, don't worry about nothing. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, not in some things, not in most things, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God or make your request known to God. So one of the more prevalent times we need to use this lifeline of prayer is during the time of worrying. I'm sure many of us know that just as much as Paul knew that. One of the greatest times we need to use this lifeline of prayer is when we're worrying. Worrying is something that we all experience or something that we will experience at some point, a number of times throughout our lives. But we have the remedy right here. We have the remedy for anxiety, and this is really the remedy for most of the things that happen in our lives. Prayer. That's the remedy for most of the things that happen in our lives because prayer is our lifeline. And it's the lifeline that allows us to commune with and, and communicate with the Father wherever and whenever. But this is not something that happens simply by speaking words. It's not something by happening that happens that speak by speaking empty words. But when we come to God in prayer, we speak words from the heart. We speak directly from our heart. God doesn't want us to seek him with our behavior. He doesn't want us to seek him with our words, but he wants us to seek him with our entire hearts. He wants us to seek him earnestly and consistently. But it has to be our desire. This must be our desire to seek God earnestly and, and consistently. It got to be our desire. So Paul says through prayer and petition, we make our requests known to God. Or we communicate with the Father through prayer and petition. So what is a petition? A petition is simply writing. So Paul is basically saying in this text, through verbal communication or through written communication or oral communication or written communication, you can make your request known to God. So by speaking or writing these things, we can come before God with anything we desire that is in his will. 
But we could come before God with anything we can we desire to remove anxiety, to remove stress, to remove worry, to remove doubt, but we can make it known before our God. And so for those of us who don't know what to say to God, aside from the Holy Spirit being our um, interceder or being our intercessor rather and interceding for us when during a time we don't know what to say, you can simply write down your prayers. There are many people who have prayer journals, which are a great way to, to capture everything you want to lay before the Lord. Sometimes you don't know what to say in the moment. But when you get a pen and pad in front of you, that's a moment or opportunity for you to write down everything you want to say before the Lord. Write down everything you want to make known before the Lord. And then you can write down your requests and you can remember them in a way. So when God starts to move and do certain things in your lives, you'll start to see what you asked for or remember what you asked for before you wrote, because you wrote it down. So when you write it down, you can see the things that, that you've asked for and you can see how God moves in your life and start to answer the prayers that you requested or that you wrote down in your prayer journal. And you'll be blown away by how God is responding to your petitions. You'll be blown away how, by how God is responding to your oral communication by your communion with him. So God will do everything we ask of him that is in his will, especially because God responds or when he responds to us, it shouldn't be a shock or it shouldn't be a surprise because we should know what we've asked the Lord for. We should know what we made or declared before the Lord in his presence. So everything God does for us and when he starts to move for us, it shouldn't be a shock or surprise. So writing down our prayers is another opportunity for us to go right back to the, to the resources. See, yeah, I asked God for this. This is simply what I've been praying about. This is simply what I what I went to God for on January 2nd of this year. I remember I prayed to God and asked him for this. So now when he starts to make things happen in my life, it ain't a shocker to me. This is, this is what my God does. This is what my father does. So it really doesn't, doesn't matter which form we use to make our requests known, either verbally or by pen, pen and paper. But what matters most is that we are making them known before God. That's what matters most. That when we have the opportunity to make these requests known before God, that we're taking advantage, full advantage of the opportunity because God wants to hear our hearts through prayer. He's given us access to this lifeline. He's given us access to the lifeline of prayer. And I mentioned Sunday how we got to get back to the art of prayer. That's the church in general. That's the universal church. We got to get back to the art of prayer, communicating with God as often as possible. And see, one of the reasons I think that we neglect to see prayer as a lifeline or even utilize prayer as a lifeline is because of laziness. Laziness is a prayer killer. And I think that's one of the reasons we neglect to use it as our lifeline and neglect to use it, period, when we know we should be using it. We neglect to use it out of pure laziness. But I mean, let's be honest, prayer is work. It doesn't matter if you write your prayers down or if you speak your prayers. Prayer is work. But laziness is one of the prayer killers. And see, prayer is work because it requires concentration. It requires humility. It, re it requires collected thoughts. It requires content and rationale and a purpose. We don't go before God without a purpose. We go before him, number one, to get into his presence. And number two, like Paul said, to make our requests known before him. So we go before God with a purpose. So it requires work on our end, but it always finishes or the outcome gets us to an expected place where God wants us to be. And the, the outcome is always an expected outcome for our good. So yes, it's work, but it's work we accept. It's work we take on because we know the outcome of that work will be for our benefit. We know the outcome of that work will be for our good. But so many of us, we get lazy with prayer and it starts to show in our lives. The laziness we have in prayer, it starts to show in our lives. But why wouldn't we want to go before the Lord in prayer? Why wouldn't we want to use this lifeline as often as possible, as much as possible? But see, when we're, when we're lazy in prayer, that laziness starts to bleed over in other areas of our lives. And why wouldn't it? If we're lazy with going before the Lord, with something he's given us access to that enables us to get in his very presence, why wouldn't that same laziness bleed over into our work? Why wouldn't that same laziness bleed over into our 
household? Why wouldn't that same laziness bleed over into our social life? So the same laziness we have in prayer, it bleeds over into every other area of our lives. And if we're lazy and using the most powerful weapons, it's only fitting that the same lazy approach would be taken in everything else in our lives. This is why Jesus told us in Matthew 24. He said to keep watch and to pray. That way you won't enter into temptation. Why? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yes, there are moments where we don't want to pray. If, if you have moments like that, trust me, you ain't alone. There are moments when we don't want to pray. But as Jesus told his disciples and reminded us that we have to continually pray so that we don't fall into temptation. Yes, our flesh is weak. We don't feel like doing it. But the spirit man is always willing. The spirit man always wants to get into the presence of God. So God doesn't get lazy on us. Therefore, we shouldn't get lazy on him. And then maybe we need to simply incorporate overcoming laziness in our prayer life. If that's something that you, you've seen or, or recognized has trickled over into other parts of your life, then maybe that's just something we need to add to our prayer journal. But when we understand this lifeline, we do everything possible to not let anything get in the way. We do everything possible to not stop or block this lifeline. Instead, we block out, we block out all distractions, all laziness, all people, and anything else that prohibits us from getting into the presence of God through prayer. Especially because Paul tells us what we can expect from using this lifeline. He tells us what we can expect, the outcome, the expected outcome, that's for our benefit from using this lifeline. And not only does it get us into the presence of God, but from being in the presence of God, Paul says in verse 7, he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So pray, right? So we get that part. Verse 6, Paul said pray. But then he says in verse 7, and from prayer, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So prayer always results in peace. It will always result in peace. But this isn't any type of peace because God's peace is not like any old type of peace. Jesus said, the peace I give you, uh, the peace I give you, I don't give you like as the world gives. So this peace that God gives, the peace of Jesus is different. It's not any old peace. It's not peace like the world tries to give us. This isn't peace like the world's peace, and it certainly isn't peace that, that you can find anywhere else outside of God. But this is what we experience from what? From worrying about nothing and praying about everything. This is the outcome. This is the result from utilizing our lifeline. And this is what we experience from making our prayers and petitions known before God. So if you want to experience supernatural peace, we must do supernatural things that affects everything in the natural. And prayer is a supernatural act or transaction that affects, has the ability to affect everything in the natural. When we pray in the spirit, we are uh, doing a, a supernatural transaction with the Lord in the name of Jesus through the spirit that will affect everything in the natural. And peace is a state of being that transcends our, all of our circumstances. It transcends all of our issues and all the people we got to deal with and their attitudes. The peace of God suppresses everything else because it becomes the most dom dominant thing in our lives when we're utilizing this lifeline. The peace of God becomes the most dominant and powerful thing in our lives that to where nothing else matters, but it comes through prayer. And the closer we draw to God, the more peace we experience. The more we use this lifeline, the more peace we have in this life. And this is an unexplainable peace. This is an unexplainable peace. This is a peace that will have you smiling for no reason. <laughs> this is a peace that will, that will have you offering to lend a helping hand to the person you can't even stand. This is a peace that will have you, have you offering to give up your seat to the person that may have cursed you out last week. This is a peace that will have you feeling like you're walking on clouds because nothing else matters because God has got everything under control. He's gotten everything handled. So we must get better at using a lifeline of prayer on an individual level, but also on a corporate level. 
This lifeline is important on both levels, individual and on a corporate level. It's important for the believer, but it's also important for the church. And this is what brings God's pleasure. This is what brings pleasure to our Father. So we must have a desire to use this lifeline for our good and for God's glory. And every opportunity we get, God has given us an, uh, an amazing asset, access or amazing access to him through the lifeline of prayer. We have direct access to God, the creator of the universe, through the lifeline of prayer. And this access is amazing when we're using it for our good. There are some supernatural benefits to the lifeline of prayer. And you can be effectively led by the Holy Spirit in prayer. You can know and discern the will of God for your life. And in prayer, you can operate tremendous miracles and authority in prayer. Supernatural life, this supernatural life is for you. Why? Because you are a child of God. God has given you this access. You are a child of God, born into his kingdom with all the rights and privileges of a joint heir. So with this access, we got to ensure that we are utilizing it or using it for our good and ultimately for the glory of God. God wants us to wants to give us what he desires for our lives. And sometimes this only comes by using the lifeline of prayer. It only comes by using the thing that God has given us access to. The thing that God wants to use as a form of communication between him and his children. Come through the lifeline of prayer. So we got to ensure we are utilizing it for our lives and using it as if our lives depended on it because it does. Our life depends on utilizing the lifeline of prayer. What are your thoughts?